Welcome back to the Fantasy Rugby Drive podcast. Thanks for downloading and listening. My name's Bruce Wilkinson. Joining me in the booth is the man primarily made of moss. How are you, mate? How could I be anything other than excited and energised after an opening like that? What an opening. Absolutely. It is just, just the, the, you know, pounding music, uh, you know. Refreshing. Ex- oh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's just got to calm down now. You know, the adrenaline is up. I love it. Um, I do want to open the podcast with a with a little bit of a different twist. I want to offer you a trade. I'm listening. I would like um, to hear your initial thoughts on Andre Esterhausen for LMNOP. Um, yeah. I, I, Shelf I, need... that. I don't want an answer now. Okay. I don't want an answer. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to take it at any time during the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's that's the there's a there's a time lapse on it then. It's, That's right. A, absolutely. Uh, yeah, one time only offer. It is indeed. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of the Chiefs a little bit later. So we're going to review the games um, pretty similar to what we did last week. I think we'll more try and figure out um, going forward what's going to happen, um, looking at some key points and key takeaways from a fantasy perspective in each of those as opposed to running through uh, the individual games themselves. But let's start with the, the Highlanders. Um, actually, let's just before we do that, a little bit of admin. So you can follow us on Twitter, Fantasy Rag Draft. It's Fantasy R E G Draft, or drop us an email at support at fantasyrugbydraft.com. Getting a lot of um, feedback questions through, um, a lot of trading going on. Um, I think that's a byproduct. Um, a lot of to do with the, che- uh, the cheaters, kings, and force no longer being around. There's a lot less players in the player hub that you can pick up. It's a noticeable uptick in um, in trading, which is great. We actually love trading. It's really, really difficult to get a good trade done, but um, nonetheless, I think it's, it's you know, if you're not trading, you're not drafting. Okay, um, so j- just before you jump into talking about some games of rugby that I didn't see, um, <laughs> just just a couple of things. So so one thing is just you were talking about trades. I literally made a trade just before this started. Just thought it might be interesting because it sort of goes back to what you are saying about limited Positions. So I, I traded away the Stormers front row, um, and got mm. Geronimo de la Fuente back. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of risky. I think he'll be back soonish. So, you know, and he's a good player that, that we, we both like. I had the Reds and the Stormers front row and yeah. it just, it just seemed pointless to, to hold on to, a, especially a front row where you, you know, like, you know, you're going to be able to use them every week. They're not going to be out injured sort of thing. Um, and yeah, so, so, you know, if you, if you got good players, um, and you're not going to be able to use them. You might as well trade away and just kind of get something for them. To be honest, I would have taken kind of anything for it, and I was yep. pretty happy with what I got. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I see a lot of teams out there at the moment that have these types of carrying these types of two very good players or you know, position players in the yeah. front row position. If you look at, um, and, and you need to get something for them. Um, and it doesn't need to be a massive. Obviously, when you're trading with some folks, they know the market for it, and you just have to look around to see who else is in need of a front row. But I think that's a great trade. I don't think you're, you're never really going to have, you know, well, you can't start both of them, and you can't do much else with it apart from a bye week. Um, and you should be able to get away with that and picking up a midfielder of De La Fuente. Was that in our, the old podcast league? No, no, that's okay. a that's a Billy Whitungy trade. Okay, I was going to say because that um, that might weaken my position for selling you a midfielder in, in the old <laughs> podcast league. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And and speaking about front rows, and it's something that um, I'll, I'll bring along next week, which is to say that um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> that next week's podcast will be slightly less shit, is what I'm saying. Um, I tr- thought I'd break down how the individual scoring goes within front rows because we often talk about you know is it a single player that's contributing to the overall score of the front row. And I wanted to sort of look at a few of them because I, I understand if you looked at the Reds, like we all know where the points are coming from. If we looked at the Stormers, is it, a, is it one player? Is it, is they all contributing? It's really kind of hard to say because none of them are particularly high profile with maybe the exception of Kitsoff. So I just wanted to, and, I, and I'll, I'll do that next week is just sort of break it down and say, okay, these front rows are very dependent on this player and these are kind of spreading it around. And it'd just be interesting to see how that pans out. Yeah. Yeah. Great shout. Look forward to that. Um, just extending on your, um, I've got value on my bench to get something for it. I also see a lot of managers out there carrying kind of two tier one fly halves and 
tier one fly halves at the moment are few and far between, and I'm not even sure I'd put Bowden Parrot and Foley in that tier one. But um, I see a lot of you know Sanchez and Barrett sitting there, and I understand why that that happens, but I don't think you're going to get um, a bit of time to get really really good value from that spare fly half. Make sure you get a fly half and back that is serviceable or is in that tier two and is actually a starter. But I just think there's a massive desire and a massive market for tier one fly halves at the moment. I think you still can lump Bowden Barrett in there just because of the name, but we'll get to him in a minute. But his his average points per game is like 10 or 11. So I wanted to have that question a little bit later. But I wanted to extend the front row out into that, that fly half position as well, where there's a severe lack of players in the player hub. So Sofawanga and Polo, would you class them... Both tier one? Yep, I would. Yep. Okay. I'd, I'd leave Barrett in there um, as well. Sanchez, um, obviously, Dinak. Um, but, I'm, you know, I'm looking at... I've seen players with... I've seen managers with Bowden and, and Sanchez there. I've seen managers with Foley and Sanchez. I think there's a time, you know, you're probably not going to really play the match-up, certainly with, say, Foley and Sanchez. I think... You're really just wanting to cover a bye week and injury um, in that situation, and I think you can really upskill your team and get a lot more value than you might have in previous seasons for that bench fly half of yours. Right, and this and this next question might be because it's a little bit of homework for you, so probably it might be a bigger question than what you can answer right now. But I, I, what I'm interested in is that you know we're, we're kind of a quarter of the way through the season. If you were redrafting, how much your rankings would have changed? Mm-hmm. You know, from, from the start of the season. And I suppose that that's the larger question. And then I guess the, the more kind of specific one is in that top 10 or top 20, like who's the player that's dropping out that you're the most worried about? And, and I, I'm sort of got that list in front of me and I'm just sort of scanning down. And I think Vince Arso at 13 is going to be yeah. somebody that you're very worried about. Yep. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not accounting Yako Creel in here because that's obviously it's an injury and there's nothing he can do about that. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, you Barrett. Got, Bowden Barrett. Okay, interesting. Yep. I am worried about him, and a lot of it comes down to playing New Zealand derbies a lot. You know, and there's nothing new that we haven't. You know, we knew that going into the season, but he's not putting up. It's three straight kind of average 11 point performances now. He's not, and he is kicking goals. <laughs> you know, this is this is with him kicking. So it's it's to me it's it's quite alarming. And you're not going to get away from the derbies towards the business end of the season as well. So um, I'm concerned about him. To answer your question, um, I'd probably swap around a few, just kind of knee-jerk. I'd probably swap around the outside backs. I probably wouldn't have Folau number one. Let's see what he does when he comes home. Uh, comes home, But I'd still have Naholo and, and Thingy up there, uh, Naholo and Rico up there. I'd still probably have the midfielders. I would raise Damien McKenzie up somewhere in that mix of top five. Um, but that's more to do with the fly halves like Foley and like Pollard, like Bowden Barrett. They've been terrible so far. They haven't produced anywhere near what you'd want from them, as well as the the limited pool of, of really good fly halves, as I was just kind of mentioning before. Now, that kind of shelves the concept or the idea going into the season that there's quite a high attrition rate in the fly halves, and we don't really know yet, but... Looking at the team sheet today with Damian McKenzie at fullback, that that was quite a catalogue of events to get him into 15. There's been Pulu, Stevenson, McNichol, Marty McKenzie, and probably one other, I just can't remember the name of now, before he actually goes in 15. Um, and that all happened all at the same time. So um, looking at the way that they... Are using him and potentially we thought it was 20 minutes maybe a game that he'd switch back there and now that they're, he's playing 15, uh, I, I certainly, if I reach after now, would have him right in that top five. Um, let's get on to players from the Highlanders and Stormers match. Did you see this one? This is one I did see, yep. Okay, all right. Um, what was your main takeaway? What do you want to talk about with fantasy here? Uh... I didn't take away a whole lot. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't read too much into some of the big performances. I'm not, I'm like Aaron Smith, for instance. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, still not, you know, he's probably top five maybe, but you know, he's not top three when everybody's fit. Mm-hmm. But, um, 
one of the things was the the Hollanders left wingers. <laughs> they just they don't they don't like these guys. Um, no. Is everybody left handed in the team and just prefers to pass <laughs> left to right? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, I don't know. We don't really know what happened to Jet Li, do we? Um, just haven't. This is probably have I had this rant this season about the lack of quality journalism and rugby and how beat reporters are supposed to be covering teams just with. Just completely no, miss. You probably have, yeah. I oh, probably know. have. I, I I'll say it again. Can, and I'm, I'm, gonna say it. <laughs> I'm gonna say it three times. This is one of the instances as well, is what happened to Jet Lee. You know, they talked about s- subtle changes in the loose forward trio and, um, uh, some, but they never actually talked about where one of the main strike weapons was in the 23. Um, I'll get on to Sergio Peterson and Reese Hodge kicking in a, a little bit later. But for me, one of the takeaways I thought was, and it's not really news to anybody, is SP Murray's injury is going to mean a little bit of a shuffle for um, the Stormers coming back home. Dylan Lates so will probably go to 15. The thing that concerns me a little bit with SP Murray's injury is that it was supposed to be Monday night that he's having a rib scan, and we haven't heard anything yet. And the Stormers are usually pretty good. Um, Fleck usually has a conference and, and lets everybody know around about their injuries when it happens. So I just wonder if maybe they're getting a, a second review there. But that does mean that there'll be more time for lates and an uptick for him at fullback. And we don't know about Sanatli yet, do we? We don't. Haven't heard anything. No. Um, he was a popular name on, on quite a few waiver wise, and rightfully so. I think there's a chance, you know, if he is fit, that he comes back into that team. Um, I'll tell you who is sneaky. And he hasn't been as inconsistent as he was in previous seasons as Raymond Rule. A little bit by smoke and mirrors, intercepts and long-range tries and things like that, but he's had three good form performances out of four now. Mm. I quite like him over some of the kind of average to, to the middle-range kind of spate and all of those guys. I think he's a decent, decent shout to look at. I think that's fair, yep. I'm also trading for or trying to get a few... Um, Storm is on my team. I think now that they've got this tour underway, I think Willemse is player I've been looking for. Even though you, you have to be conscious of Jean-Luc Duplessis, I think if you can get him and maybe the backup of, of Jean-Luc Duplessis, then you're pretty good position. I don't think the kicking or the lack of kicking for Willemse is necessarily hindering him as much. Um, he just he loves taking the ball to the line. Now, whether that's the right thing for the Storm as long term or not, well, I guess we'll see with when John Luke comes back, um, but for now he's a he's a point scorer. What about um, midfield? I thought it was really promising to see Thompson repeat his performance, and I'm still not. I'm, I'm kind of with you on the boat with Tay Water. I'm not entirely sure how he's doing it, but <laughs> he's putting up points too, right? It's weird, yeah, it's sort of weird because you'll get Fetters on the field for ten minutes, and he stands out, yeah. and and yet Walden, who doesn't stand out, is still somehow putting up points. So. Does. What do you reckon? What do you make of Ben Smith? That's two, that's two really good rugby performances, but he's not really doing it from a fantasy perspective. No, he, he picks and chooses when he counterattacks, and it's quite rare. Mm. I reckon you could get something for Ben Smith. I think if you had him, you might have drafted him on his name as well. He's had a couple of games at home now, and he isn't particularly well from a fantasy perspective. At least he's been sterling for. You know, actual custodian duties. But for fantasy rugby draft, I think you can get a lot more from Ben Smith than what he is actually producing for your team. So take a look at for that. Highlanders front row kind of came back a little bit. Um, and Damien Delende, solid again. Yep. Player to keep an eye on, I think was quite popular also, was Cobus Visa. Um, I know, well, you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you're not 100% convinced. I just saw the I was going to say the body of work, but just take the of work out. I just saw the body. <laughs> He's a huge, huge man. Um, I've tried to pick him up a couple of leagues as well. I just, as I said at the start, I, I quite like the idea of Stormers coming back now. Their tour is out of the way. Um, they've got a lot of South African opposition um, coming up, as well as the Blues this weekend. Should be a few points. Anything more from this, from these two teams? I just just wondered with Tavita Nabura whether... Because Aaron Major is pretty new, whether you know he doesn't maybe familiar with the players, so he just said, "Tavita, you're on the wing." Pointed at the wrong guy, you know, and he just went out there because it kind of it reminded me. I don't know if you ever heard the story when um, Shola Amiobi was was 
being, he was a Newcastle striker, Newcastle United. Bobby Robson was the manager, I think. I think it was him anyway. And, um, he, he, he was saying something about, you know, talking about how he was managed and, um, and he said, uh, oh, you know, about Bobby Robson, not being, I remember where he was. And he, he said, what did Bobby Robson call you? And he said, Carl Court, who was another guy <laughs> who looked a little bit similar to him. So that's just referred to him by the same name. Um, so it's not, I'm not sure if he was aware he had two different players in his squad. That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Looked a little bit like him. We won't get into that. Um, uh, Nibiru, we did have quite a few questions on our start bench show, um, about Nibiru and, um, it, it depends what type of fantasy manager you are. So, um, I, I'm at pains to point out that I'm a fairly conservative. I need, would like to see, unless it's a really compelling case, I would like to see it first before I thrust him straight into my lineup. I don't want to have a little bit of trust there, um, before I put him in. Um, similar thing with Daguni as well, uh, Dogunu, I should say. Um, he actually performed quite well. Um, we did hear news about Sergio Peterson. So he's been out for four months. Quite what the Stormers beat reporters were doing one of their marquee signings that it's only found out on the 14th of March that he's out for four months. Cannot believe that. I don't know how that's missed. Don't know how it's not reported. Carry on. Um, Reds, uh, your beloved Reds now, I believe it is, with the Reds front row that you have. Um, Reds Brumbies. What's the what's the talking point here? I've got one. Um, how about Rebels Brumbies? Should we talk about that instead? Rebels we, Brumbies? Well, yeah, we can talk about a game from last week, I guess, as well. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, let's go for, let's, let's start with the Reds then. <laughs> <laughs> well, we looked at, um, the, the one talking point I wanted to talk about from the Brumbies point of view was Lele Afano. Are you worried about him at all? See, we talked about tier one and tier two. I'm starting to drift him into tier two now. He gets pulled in 44 minutes. Um, he's just not showing that attacking promise that he, that he has been in the Brumbies are a, a little bit of a hot mess. They are at the moment. Yeah, no, I'd agree. He's, he's been subbed off at around about the same time, two weeks in a row. Doesn't, doesn't look like a particularly great fantasy option. And it's hard to see that sort of turning around anytime soon. I mean, I, I think it's more likely that you see Harwara take over the job than it is that you see Lili Afano all of a sudden be set fire. Yeah, I do. I wonder if there's going to be a decision made at some point that, I mean, Tavita Kurandrani and Chance Penny Spate are not getting the ball in good positions. Uh, Penny and Spate actually scored all right this weekend, which was really, really encouraging. But I wondered if they might go to those twin pivots or twin decision-making, put um, Howard at 10 and Leo Lefano at 12. Get rid of old mate Carl Godwin at 12, who again put out another pretty solid performance. Um, uh, probably a good for a solid number two or number three midfielder. Um, Probably number two, actually, to be honest, in terms of what the midfielders are doing. Um, Dalguna looked pretty sharp. Um, got 18, 19 points, I think it was. I like the look of that. Chris F. Satir was down a little bit coming into 13. It's all going to depend if they they persist with that. Um, where, what else do you want to go from the from the Reds game? Uh, so should we talk Rebels instead, maybe? Go. Uh, it's sort of Dave. It's in the page. The, yeah. <laughs> Dave Vessels seems to be, he's almost sort of player of the week, isn't he? You know, yeah. all of a sudden he just, you know, he seems like he's a genius. Yeah, absolutely. He's getting them playing quite well. Three um, bonus point wins to start to the season. I mean, it's you know, unheard of, really. Yeah, what do you make of what happens with Jack Maddox and Corabetti and Naivalu in that back three? Because... Naivalu's been pretty impressive. Corabetti looked like lightning in a bottle when he came on. He looked like he'd been wound up and just wanted to be let go. He looks like he's pushing for a starting place now. The Rebels team sheet's going to be really interesting this week. Which way do you think they're going to go? Oh, I think... I think you'll see Maddox benched. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really that familiar with the guy, so you know, it's possible he plays other positions, and if that's what you're sort of alluding to, then I have no idea. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about Maddox going into ten, but I'm just, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that that will it will kind of come to fruition. Well, what why well, for... why would you make a change that drastic with a team that's yep. going along so well? Yep, totally agree. That that's no, nope, I'm with you on that one, absolutely. And speaking of drastic change, another 
Rebels beat reporter dropping the dropping the bundle. Surely they must have seen when they watched the training that Reese Hodge was kicking a lot of goals. I guess they probably both kick goals anyway during training, but big change there for fantasy draft managers with Reese Hodge picking up the the kicks at goal. Um, but he also put in a pretty decent performance. Um, I guess you can probably shell the alarm bells for a while. Yeah, scored two tries. You know what more can you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Murphy. Very, very impressive. <laughs> he's, he's, I think, I might have said this last week, but he's going to give you owners heart attacks every week because he mm. goes down injured for the slightest things and stays down. And then when, th- and then when the whistle goes, he gets back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say a couple of things because he had that, yeah, that, that punch that was at Lucas threw him the little kind of, little kind of jab rabbit punch, I think it was, that he just collapsed in a heap. Yeah. So, oh, goodness me. And that was. Prop that out. Yeah, and then started trying to, and then somebody obviously called him a pussy and he tried to fight. <laughs> and it's like, dude, you did just, you did just take a dive. Yeah, you did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and much more from the Rebels. I, I thought they followed the front row actually. It was serviceable. I think they got put under a massive amount of pressure early on by the Brumbies who were just not very creative with the ball. Um, and that was Jordan Yerlis's yellow card. But aside from that, they would have put Put out a kind of nine ten point performance. I think I think better things to come from them. Um, let's get on to uh, uh, let's get on to probably the balls then. A little bit more disjointed. <laughs> uh, Matthews terrible letdown. Um, to be honest, it looked actually very similar to uh, Ben Lamb's performance. Only Ben Lamb got that one long range try. Was involved just as much. Just never went his way. Um, and I see he's been dropped out of the 23 altogether now. He's probably sipping on yak with uh, Tavita Lee. Um, what else did you make from this Bulls team? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm starting to feel pretty let down by the the front row. Um, yeah. Once again, just didn't 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 play that style that they did in the first game. So I think we'll shelve any talk of the Bulls front row being a factor until we start seeing that again. Um, Two locks and, as well, right? Yep, yeah. And, and, and I still think Lou Diaga looks fine. Um, you know, even when he doesn't score big points, um, I think he, he, do, he does enough. He's involved quite heavily and, uh, I think he'll do a bit more than what the average lock will. So I'm not, I'm not so worried about him. I mean, Snayman seems, always seemed a more limited player for me. And that's Agreed. why when he scored, outscored him in that first game, it wasn't Snayman I was looking for on the waiver wire, you know, because mm. I just didn't, think that was really um, something that was going to be repeatable. Yep, yep, no, that's fair. I would say the same thing as well. He's put in a couple of pretty average performances, probably yeah. symptomatic of the Bulls as well. Yeah, honest. yeah, really not excited about anyone else. Not happy to see Johnny Kotzer at 12. Um, you need to get him as far away from the ball as you can. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It is. Oh, God. Yeah. going to be farming out in the wing if you're not doing anything. I think... Um, so this week they have gone with Berger, Berger and Dot 12, so there'll be at least a little bit more distribution there. Interesting to see they've dropped Marnitz Bosch off out of the 23. I've got a question um, on a flyer for fly half, very end of the podcast, but for now, um, Halant still looked a little bit stuck in mud, but he, you know, he still gets his defenders beaten and he finished off a nice try. Um, where should we go? Let's have a look at the Crusaders and Hurricanes, I guess. So as you say, I'm a little bit all over the show. The well, we, well, we didn't actually talk about the Reds in the end, did we? <laughs> no, so, no. So, no, so, so, a little bit. so here's my sort of stat for the week and in, on the Reds. Mm-hmm. James Tuttle threw three games or four games, however many it is that, that the Reds have played. Zero running meters. <laughs> he has made zero meters across zero all those running. games. Yep. And he's yeah, played well, a lot of minutes to accumulate those those meters. So he's, you know, we had that situation where we got really excited about Nick Frisbee, you know, goal kicking, um, yep, goal, goal kicking halfback, and for say didn't get a great number of shots at goal because the Reds were so poor. Now obviously the Reds are a little bit better this year, but other than the goal kicking, Tuttle is offering you nothing. Hmm. It's true. He is. He is Frisbee two point oh, isn't he? He's uh, fairly. <laughs> Fairly limited, and I think that's they kind of want to keep him on for that goal kicking, but they quite like the more industrious blonde surfer that comes on. Is it Tate, Tate McDermott or something like that? It is. Oh, that has to keep on putting his headgear on. Yeah, got the, yeah Tate got the McDermott. On. Yeah, well, he's 19, isn't he? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I he, think he, he looks like he just turned up in his combi, eh? Like. <laughs> totally. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what he looks like. Um, okay, so looking at the Reds, uh, I would be, if I was a Nabuli owner, he's probably going to be your number four outside back, but he's a sin bin waiting to happen. Sorry, yellow card waiting to happen every single game. His propensity to intentionally knock balls on, he got away with two in this game as well. It won't be a matter of time before. He's got that moniker as well. He did that last year. And where else do you want to go with the Reds? Apart from being the top you know, top front row, the Reds front row, really, really impressive. Uh, away from home, I guess, now. Yeah, and I think the Dalgunu thing possibly just flagged up how poor the NRC competition is. I mean, sure. that, that may be a little bit unfair. I am joking. But, I mean, he, he just looked like a, an average-type player. You know, he I didn't see anything that, you know, I, you can go and watch the YouTube highlights. He'll probably tell you something different. But he didn't, <laughs> he didn't look like he was going to set the world on fire, you know. This is this is probably a very different level from where he's been playing previously. Yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment. He still scored 18 points, which in a team that wasn't flying out wide, he... he Looks like a player that's going to get a lot of defenders beaten, but maybe not you know, too many length of the field, if you know what I mean. He looks like a little kind of pocket rocket. It looks a bit like Sergio Peterson. Um, so I I think there are better things to come from him once they figure out what they're going to do inside. But to your point that you mentioned about John Benkotza, I think you can rinse and repeat that with Chris F. Satir at 13. <laughs> I don't think your wingers are going to get too much open field ball. Um. Uh, let's get on to the, the Crusaders Hurricanes team. So I guess you're probably going to have to monitor Ryan Crotty and Sam White. Look, it'd be interesting to see how they do actually approach replacing those guys in the lineup. Certainly Crotty and how they rejig it, whether they bring Tim Bateman in straight into 12 and don't disrupt the team, or whether they do as they did during the game, which was shift Goodhue in, have Tamanavalu, and then bring Matalei in. If it is Matalehi, then you've probably got a couple of games um, that you can get out of him because Crotty has had head problems in the past. So I think they're going to be very, very careful and make sure that... I know you're in or you're out of the protocol, the HIO protocol, but I think they'll handle them with kick gloves. Um, what was your main takeaway? So you clearly aren't worried about, or as worried, about Bowdoin Barrett as I am? No. No. Okay. I don't, I don't what, what makes you say that? Well, it's just that I, for me, nothing's changed other than the fact that the points have been lower. I mean, if, if you can't point to a reason why they're lower, then you've just got to put it down as one of those things. Three performances now where it's somewhere around that kind of 10 through 13 mark. And they haven't been particularly tough matchups. I think, um, obviously, the Crusaders one being the toughest. Um, but there were, there were points that they... He, probably should have done a little bit better and I don't know I, I am worried about him and I think there's probably going to be some huge games in there um, and I think you probably can actually figure out which games they are going to be but I think with New Zealand opposition so I, I am worried but TJ Piranara there's a few folks talking about um, looking at say the, the Schroeder match up against the Sunwolves last week and, and asking questions about whether you bench TJ Piranara or you got your answer um, I, I Thought it was madness personally. You don't bench TJ Paramari's matchup proof. You're in the same boat. Yeah. Jordy Barrett, good to see him coming back. Did you like um, Pat, um, Pat Lamb? Ben Lamb's showed a bit of toe, but my, my personal bit of that, personal favourite bit of that, was the commentary from Justin Marshall when he talked about his pace. And he said, "Oh, who knew <laughs> Ben Lamb had pace?" That <laughs> a sevens player. Yeah, that's right. That's like pace. how anybody and his dog who's watched rugby in the last two years knows that that's all Ben Lamb's got. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Actually, in that piece of commentary, Marshall managed to misidentify about four players that are the five, apart from Lamb. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. Hurricanes front row, good to see them point scoring again. Amua, a little bit more game time. Um, I think better things to come from then um, as well. I think the more the more game time he gets. Not that that actually was a try um, for... Eves, it's clear knock on, but uh, we don't need to get into that. What do you make of the Hurricanes or, or Crusaders? Any, where do you want to go with either of those? I don't think there's really a whole lot to say. Uh, I mean, you, you can have that discussion about Bowden Barrett. I mean, he might just be tired from the Lions series. Uh, that was that was the excuse that Eddie Jones came up with for England. True. So, uh, other than that, I mean, you'd be a little bit disappointed with Fafita. But you know, I wouldn't give up on him just yet. Um, and I don't think everyone else that you thought was going to score, well, 
everyone else that you're going to play, you're still going to play. You know, you don't have sort of too many concerns. And we flagged out Mitchell Hunt last week, and we said, don't get excited, and this is why. So, yep. Tier two. Absolutely, yeah. So I don't think there's really much, a whole lot else to uh, to add to that from my point of view. Starting fly half, that'll get you some points if you're in a bind. I think that's about as far as you're going to get. What are you going to do about Vince Arso? And I'm asking because there's someone very close to myself who has this situation. Are you going to get anything for him at this point? I think, oh, can you get something for him? I mean, you, you're probably getting maybe 70 cents on the dollar, right? Mm. And You're not going to get a player like Pimpy. You're not going to no. get Dante. No. You're not going to get LMNOP. No. I wouldn't do any of those deals. Uh, just In re- saying all of that, I just I just cannot see Chris Boyd not bringing him back into the team. Now, there's a lot of double negatives in there that I'm not entirely sure about what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's that I think Arso has to get back in that team at some point. It just seems madness that Boyd doesn't bring him into the starting lineup. You think he might? You think he might sit on that bench for what you think Lamb and potentially Hooson are going to start ahead of him? I think what I think in a situation like this doesn't really mean shit because okay. because it's it, it wasn't something that we expected and now it's happened. So our track record was obviously already not that good. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Look, I, I I yeah. Okay. To to tangible action plan, I, I think you kind of sit put. Uh, I don't think you can going to get. I wouldn't be happy with getting seventy cents on the dollar on the chance that he does actually get that. I prefer to, to see if he gets that that position back. Yeah, I'm, no, I agree. I probably I wouldn't I wouldn't do it for seventy cents probably. Mm. Uh, what about I'd, someone like Matsushima? No, someone down that mid. You'd want Arso still? I'd still keep Arso. Yeah, mm. I think so. I think there's enough there in that team as well. Um, okay. Just thinking about maybe. We'll see Sonatla because sonatla has been kicking around on waiver wires. It almost feels like he's been devalued a lot. But, mm. uh, gee, that, I mean, that might be one I'd start thinking about. I probably would, I wouldn't do it actually. I wouldn't, but, yeah. but he's I'd in the position. Arso. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's probably about as much as we've got for these two teams. You got anything more from Hurricanes Crusaders? No, like I said, I think it's, it's reasonably obvious. Yeah, that's right. Tough matchup this weekend with the Highlanders down in Forsyth Bar. Crusaders not actually firing. Biggest belief that we can only get uh, Mitch Hunt and Mike Delaney as our backups. No disrespect to those guys, but I would have thought coming to a uh, Super Rugby Championship. Seems like a bit of an oversight, shall we say, from Scott Robinson, who's a very, usually a very thorough coach. Um, how is that? How is that anything other than a disrespect? You just said they weren't, they weren't good enough. They're not no good dis- enough. No disrespect, disrespect but they're rubbish. Well, Mike Delaney has done really well to get to this position, right? Uh, he's a he's a ITM Cup kind of minor ten cup level player who is a, probably a second string fly half. Uh, don't worry, he's they're, not, not, good they're, not, they're not listening. It's all right. <laughs> to the Delaney family, apologies. Um, uh, let's play a little bit of uh, so let's play our four and form game. Are you looking forward to this? Absolutely. <laughs> So for and form brought to you by Manager Pro, fantasyrobydraft.com forward slash Manager Pro, where winning is everything. Unlock all the great features, team news in your lineup, and average points per game, which is starting to prove um, quite valuable now that we're four weeks into the season. Right. Can you name me any of the top four in form? Uh, I'll give you a clue. Rob Thompson. No. 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 I'll give you a clue. Three of them are the same. As last week. As last week. Um, is is Sal Mackey still in there? Number two, okay. based on that one performance of three weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. and Deanti is probably still in there. He is, number four. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm wondering whether... Is the Elton Yankees slipped in, uh, slipped in there? <laughs> slipped in? No. Nope. Might have slipped in. I don't know. <laughs> Scripped in there. No, okay. Uh, Your love child? Uh, D-Mac, yeah. D-Mac. Okay. Number one is still out there, and it's this week's performance. You own him in about two or three of two, two of at least that I know of. Okay. Um, Played the Sunwolves. Oh, my pimpy. The pimp. Yeah. Okay. The pimp. So quality performance from him. Um, we'll get into the sharks, but yeah, those are our four and four. Re- really interesting to start to see. 
um, not just your total points with those with the form. It's it's really quite useful to to pull the cream right to the top of that player hub. Right. Um, let's get on to that Sharks game. Actually, did you see this one? I didn't. Yeah. So we've been we've been calling for the Warthog, and we got him. And yeah, as build, just impressive. Um, one particular, the try that he scored, the in and away, the show and go, it was, it was, yeah, it's awesome. So, I don't think you probably, get, <laughs> I don't think you can look at a 50 point performance every week, but Sharks front row, if you've got them now, um, and you've held on to them and you didn't lose faith, fair play to you. Um, don't think we need to discuss the pimp on Kosi. Andre Easterhausen is playing very, very well. They go on tour now, but he's the type of player that probably is fairly tour proof, if you will. Being, being a 12 and 13, but he looks thinner. He looks like he might have slimmed down in the off-season as well. He looks really, really strong. Um, uh, and I guess from the, the Sunwolves' perspective, you've got Matt Sashima, who played really, really well, and Lamarki, both in a losing performance, did, did pretty pretty impressive stuff. And one player that's been added in a few waiver wires, and I'm not 100% convinced about it, is Michael Little. Um, he got it a lot. He just was involved a lot, um, and it did open up. I don't expect this to be necessarily a thing. Um, I think if you've got a spare bench spot, it might be okay rolling the dice, but the Sun Wolves chop and change their team so much, and this was a fairly open game, so I'm not convinced about it. Uh, Tatako was kicking the goals for whatever that's worth. Um, let's, let's go on to probably the match of the round. Did you see this one, the Blues-Lions? I did not. Mm, this was um, really, really impressive. I was going to ask you what you thought the storyline might have been from this game, and you probably can get into it without without actually seeing the game. I, I think you probably did have to see the game, because <laughs> I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Sure. Well, I was going to say it's a pair of franchise. You know, how did he play when he came on? Um, the, two, the two things I was going to look at was Rico at 13, what impact did it have? And Pera Franchise coming on. Um, Pera Franchise looks great. It looked really, really impressive. Um, wasn't a coincidence that the last 20 minutes was when the Blues came over the top. He set that back line a hell of a lot better than, than Gatlin did. And he's just a, a lot crisper. And he just looks like a, just looks like a classy 10, really classy 10. Um, I thought the, the shift from Rico to 13 did stifle him a little bit for most of the match. It freed up quite late, and that's where he got a lot of his points, a lot of his tries. But the Sonny Boy Williams Rico thing you know, wasn't... Well, it certainly didn't have Rico at the wing kind of options and, and points as well. But yeah, I, I thought there was a little bit of a restriction there. Um, maybe it's just the first game as well with, with these two playing in the, in the centres. Nano and Collins, very, very good. Duffy, that's two bad performances from him. He's probably a name that I would, you know, I'd prefer Rule over Duffy, for instance. Um, I just think I'm a little bit nervous about why the ball isn't necessarily travelling that way as well. It's the opposite of the Tevita Lee problem at the Highlanders. Um, Akira Yuani can't do much about that. He's awesome. <clears throat> um, and the front row looked good as well. I thought the reserve guys that they had coming on and starting in the front row really, really powered that, that team to, to go for 80 minutes, which was not the conventional wisdom at high altitude. I think a few folks thought that they might peter out. It was the opposite. Um, that's probably, I think, um, well, obviously, Diante is another player that's just putting up points and continually putting up points. I'm not convinced that Skosan is going to get back in the team, even if he comes back. I, I wondered whether they might just ask Skosan to properly heal, if you know what I mean, um, before he comes back into that team. Was there any uh, anything you wanted to talk about without seeing the game about these two teams? No, there isn't. And no. It's at yeah. this point, again, in the podcast that we lost Mossman. Um, so just to finish off with the uh, Haguaru's... Um, Waratah's match. Um, Waratah's not particularly impressive at all. Um, worrying signs for Bernard Foley. I think we'll give him a stay of execution till he gets home. Um, I don't think I'd be trying to sell him for, you know, for less than full value just yet. Let's see how he gets on back home. But he's been very, very poor thus far. Um, 
and actually um, most of the New South Wales forward pack hasn't been great to be honest um, Folau's stats were padded with that last minute try but I guess they all count um, the Waratahs front row has been actually decent from a front uh, from a um, fantasy perspective so um, I would you know, if, as I mentioned before with limited position um, in the player hub I would have thought that they're a decent value as well to, to have a look at um, and play in the Rebels this week uh, Jake Gordon's good. buffelli has been very good. Sanchez, probably top tier. Um, if you haven't noticed that Kramer is, for that match, was um, playing on the blind. Uh, sorry, playing open side. And uh, he's listed as a lock in the game. Picked up 10 points. Um, so that's his, that's that's certainly someone that you might want to have a have a look at to see if he's uh, to roll the dice, see if he does that again this week. They got the Reds this week, so not a massively tough matchup. Um, and the Haguara's front row, from a fantasy perspective, came back to life. And I think those that are scratching around with the Chiefs, Rebels, Bulls, probably can do worse than having a look at the Haguara's front row and hope that this is a trend in the right direction. I was going to mention to ask Mossman for a bit of a stash fly half, um, as we mentioned last week, to do with Martin Landajo, for instance. Um, which kind of player or which fly half, backup fly half, would you stash out of Marty Mack, Tian Falcon, Mani Lobok, um, or Hawara? And my my answer to that was Tian Falcon. I, I thought if if D Mac went down, that Falcon had probably come in and kicked the goals. Now. Um, we know that Marty Mack is just back from um, injury as well, and plays well at ten, and potentially gets the gets the nod in that position. But I just think Falcon might put up more points, and is worth taking a little bit of a risk on if you've got that spare bench spot, which most most managers don't at this time of the season. Um, but I was holding on to Boshoff, for instance, so I've gotten rid of him for Falcon. So that's about all the time we have. So remember, we've got our start bench show on Friday at 6.30 again. Um, so put your hashtag start bench on Twitter and Facebook, um, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can on fr- at Friday. Um, and follow us on Twitter at Fantasy Rug Draft. That's Fantasy R-E-G Draft. Or drop us a note at support at fantasyrugbydraft.com. Uh, that's about all we have for today. My name's Bruce Wilkinson. He's Nathan Mossman. That's news to me. How do you repeat it? What a bust here by Christian Cullen. Plenty of support and what a dummy.